Good evening. My name is Dorian Lewis, and I will be your moderator for this evening's lecture. Welcome to another lecture given by members of the Southfield Michigan class. This is a school, not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious, and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his, his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as the result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio, in the year 1931. We hold classes in the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. The Southfield, Michigan class was established in 1997. The Dean of the Southfield, Michigan class is Dr. Marvin Lewis. The president is Dr. Edward Ewell, and the vice president is Dr. Ronald Atkins. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, as they are contained in the original Hebrew texts. The true name of the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted with Lord. The true title of the word or son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted with God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted with Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that will produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings of the true name of our Heavenly Father and his son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We've drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man cannot perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form can only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now, there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should all ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai and showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. 
Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of the most holy place, the holy place, and the court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Our primary constitutional aims and objectives are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without, excuse me, uh, second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained that there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. And at this time, we will have a prayer given by Dr. Jeremy's Bivens, followed by a scripture reading, which will be um, Daniel, the eighth chapter read by Dr. Lauren Lewis. Oh, good morning, good evening class. Good evening. Um, Heavenly Father, Yahweh Elohim, I thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this class, to have another opportunity to learn as much as I can about you in these last days. As that um, you give the vessels on the floor, um, the insight to help us through these last days. I ask this in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Hallelujah. 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 I can never, ever, ever. I'd like to say good evening to the class. And I'll be reading out of the King James Version, substituting the true names where appropriate. That's Daniel, the eighth chapter. In the third year of the reign of King Belshar, excuse me, Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in a vision and I was by the river of Uli. Then I lifted up my eyes and saw and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will 
and became great. And as I was concerning, excuse me, and, I, and as I was considering, behold, and he go came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with the collar against him and smote the ram and break his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. <clears throat> and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven and cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the hosts and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And as excuse me, and a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and practiced and prospered. Then I heard one son speaking and another son said unto the certain son which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,200 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep on my face toward the ground, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation, for at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the great horn is, that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce continents and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hands. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was six certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. That was Daniel, the eighth chapter. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I want to thank everyone for joining us again. Today, we are uh, going to pick up where we left off from last week. Last week, we listened to Dr. King's lecture titled, uh, audio lecture and transcript titled, 
2300 days in the millennium. And so it was a good suggestion by uh, Dr. Dye that we read uh, the section on 2300 days in the textbook. So today, well, let me say this, we're going to um, spend however much time you guys want to spend with this, this topic, 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary. But today we're going to try to get through reading this section in the textbook. And then we, we can go back. We're going to go back and whatever questions people have or things that Yahweh has showed you, you want to point out, then we'll do that. You know, if it takes three classes, it takes three classes. It takes 10, whatever. But these things are important. So we're going to try to um, go into them. But, but like I said, today is we're going to focus on reading this section. And then we'll uh, we'll see where, where we go, where Yahweh leaves us with it. So that said, Anybody can read. I'm going to start out reading, but please, if you feel like, like you want to read, this is on, uh, this is in volume four, page 45. Uh, anybody can chip in and read anything you guys want me to reread, any, any comments you guys want to make, you think it'll be helpful as I'm reading or as we're reading, please chime in. This is going to, uh, we're going to do like Dr. Kinley said in one of his lectures. We are going to sweat it out. <laughs> We're going to try to get a better understanding, you know, for those of us who don't have an understanding of 2300 days. I know I didn't until I uh, read this section and listened to the lecture and certainly don't have it all, but I have a lot better understanding. So take your time. We all friends here. Don't worry. You know, you got any questions, ask your questions. All right. So with that, we are going to start. As I said, this is Elohim, the Archetype Original Pattern of the Universe, Volume 4, section titled, The Cleansing of the Sanctuary in the 2300 Days of Prophecy, of the Prophecy. In Daniel 8 and 1 through 2 and 13 and 14, we read, In the year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam. And then I heard one saint speaking to another saint, said, excuse me. And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long, <clears throat> excuse me, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, unto, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which, is, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up thou the vision, for it shall be for many days. As pertaining to the sanctuary, which was the body of Yahshua the Messiah, and the host trodden underfoot during the 2300 day period with Yahweh, Matthew said, Yahshua, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints, the sons, which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. The Jews said unto Yahshua the Messiah, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing thou doest these things? Yahshua answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in the building and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Again, the Jews asked Yahshua to show them a sign. And he said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well or fish's belly, so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah reads thusly. Now Yahweh had prepared a great fish to, to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The reader will notice that we have explained that the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were carried captive to Babylon in 604 BY. Wherefore, Daniel saw this vision about BY 555, or 49 years or seven weeks before the decree of Cyrus 
in 534BY, or 98 years before the going forth of the commandment of Artaxerxes in BY 457, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah. Now, if we add the 33 years of the life of the Messiah to the 457, 457 years before his birth, we have the 70 weeks or 490 years which reached to Pentecost to complete the fulfillment of the prophecy. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So now they've got these uh, tables and charts. And like I said, I know we have... Um, We've got quite a few uh, vessels here that Yahweh has given some uh, insight to this on. We're going to, I'm not going to read all of this. We're going to come back to it, though. I want to kind of stick with the text right now, unless somebody got a better idea. But I want to kind of stick with the text. So, um, but we will be coming back to this. So, this is just showing the calculation to verify the 2300 days of prophecy, the time fixed by Yahweh to build the temple, 490 years. So it's quite a few calculations, but I'm going to, all right. So now this text he has, he's explaining these, uh, these charts. I'm going to read this text because there's some important stuff in here. We must also remember that Yahshua the Messiah is master and rabbi, or Yahweh Elohim, as seen in John 13 and 13. Can you grab that real quick, Lauren, please? Mm -hmm. John 13 and 13. Mm -hmm. Let's read that verse. You call me master and rabbi, and you say, well, for so I am. That's Yahshua declaring that he is the master and rabbi, as Dr. Kinley says here. We must understand that the 2300 days mentioned in Daniel, now this is a key point. I know this helped me a, a, a lot. <laughs> we must understand that the 2300 days mentioned in Daniel 8 and 14 are a part of the 70 weeks or 490 year period. However, we must also understand that the real true sanctuary that must be cleansed in the 2300 day period is the sacrificial body of Yahshua the Messiah, which was made a curse and hung upon a tree or the cross. Prophetically speaking, the body of Yahshua the Messiah was made to be the atoning sacrifice for the world and was made to be sin or the scapegoat for us, that we may be the righteousness of Yahweh Elohim in him. As David stated in Psalms 90 and 4, and Peter quoted in 2 Peter 3 and 8, both saying that one solar day with Yahweh, not the man, is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Now, to confirm the statement in Psalms and Peter, we must see this in its execution and application in the case of the first man, Adam. Paul said that the first man, Adam, was a figure of the second Adam, Yahshua the Messiah. Therefore, what applied to the first Adam reflected itself in the case of the Messiah as applied to time with Yahweh. That is, Elohim told Adam that the day that he touched or ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. On the same solar day that Adam did touch and eat the fruit, instantaneously he died. That is, on the same solar day, he was condemned before Elohim in his consciousness, and he hid himself, themselves, among the trees. But it took this death of Adam the remainder of the 930 years, or 70 years short of a thousand year day with Yahweh to reflect or manifest itself in Adam's physical body. It must also be remembered that the 2300 days of prophecy is a part, no, excuse me, not also, excuse me. It must be remembered that the 2300 days of prophecy is a part of the 490 year cycle, figured from the commandment going forth under Artaxerxes for the body of Yahshua the Messiah is the temple or sanctuary of Yahweh that necessitated cleaning after being made sin for us. The resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, Elohim, was very early in the morning on Sunday, 
or the 300th part of that thousand year day with Yahweh. So now uh, this section, first I wanna um, see if uh, Dr. Marvin Lewis or uh, can give us a quick, a quick uh, overview of, I mean, you know, quick, just who was Artaxerxes and what, did, what was his edict? Cause we keep hearing about this, Artaxerxes edict in 457. So you think you can explain that real quick, Dr. Lewis? I'll, I'll, I'll try to um, go and spend a long for time. Um, Artaxerxes was a ruler that just like um, uh, that Yahweh used to uh, manifest his purpose. Now, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, Artaxerxes was not a follower, the Jew, not a Jew, but he was just like the, uh, uh, <sighs> you caught me off guard here. Um, just like, um, the other, a lot of the other rulers in the history of the biblical history that would do as Yahweh led him to do, to exercise and to help and to assist the Hebrew nation that Yahweh set up to show and manifest that he was truly with them and leading them. And Artaxerxes was one of these leaders. He felt that they were, that the, the uh, temple uh, that was torn down and that was raided and, and destroyed by the other heathens that they were wrong. They should not have done that. And so he put out an edict that they should go back and restore the temple. And the only reason he was able to do this is because even though he was not a part of the righteousness of Yahweh's Joshua the Messiah, Yahweh gave him the inkling to know the difference between right and wrong, just like every, you don't have to be in this teaching to understand and know the difference between right and wrong. That is something that man, that Yahweh has placed in man and it's called a conscience. So you don't have to be a member of this organization or sit in front of this vision before you can distinguish the difference between right and wrong. And our Xerxes is just manifesting that because Yahweh moved him to go back and replenish the temple and give the Jewish people what was rightfully their, was theirs, which was an opportunity and which was the right that they had to worship Yahweh as he really was and actually exist. And that's, leaving out all the minute details, that's really what it boils down to. See, if Yahweh, see, Yahshua, Elohim is your conscience. Yahshua is our conscience. And even someone that doesn't know the name of Yahshua can be, Yahshua still can be their conscience, even though they don't realize who it is. Now, what happens nowadays is us as mankind, we take credit for it. Well, you know, I was just, I've always been like that my whole life. When I, you know, when I recognize something is not right, I, I just try to make it right. Mm -hmm. See, so that's, what, ya what Yahshua just did with Artaxerxes, who was a ruler, has put him in a position that he identified and witnessed to the to the uh, uh, to the waste that was put unjustly placed on the Jews. Now it was part of Yahweh's purpose. Mm -hmm. and he went in there thinking like a kind of minded man that I can recompense, see, unto the Jews what's rightfully theirs and. So that sense of wanting to do right in mankind is imbued in mankind from Yahweh himself. Mm -hmm. That's the only reason you think of being right. And you never do know nothing about the name of Yahweh. Okay. All right. So Artaxerxes uh, sent forth the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. He, moved, he was moved by Yahweh to rebuild Jerusalem. So I wanted to get a, uh, just a brief overview. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, for that. Can I add something to that? Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, Cyrus... Um, after the Jews were taken into Babylon for 70 years, Cyrus, the Persian king, um, uh, after that 70 years, allowed them to go back. So that should be in those things. I just want to add that part that's, that's after the Medes and the Persians 
uh, beat up the Babylonians and they became the rulers of the world. And then after them became Daniel the uh, horn, which was in the scripture lesson. But anyway, I just want to add that, that they were Persians all the way up to outer Xerxes. Okay. So this is a part, thank you, Dr. Ewell. This is a part of the history. And I know that, at least for me, that sometimes, if you don't know the history, it can be kind of confusing. But again, well, remember too, remember with the Persians and the Medes, they were the rulers of the world or the known world at that time. Right. Which was where Iran and those countries are at now. Right. It's what was old Persia, Medes, and things like that. Now, that was not the whole world at the time, but that was the known world. Right. Nobody knew about any other part of the world as far as putting it in books and writing it down, but that area of the world at the time. So right. that's Media, Persia. And of course, they were the ruling, like Ed says, they were the rulers of the world at that time. Then along comes Alexander the Great and destroys all of that, but that'll come later on. Go ahead, right. Lord. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. I just want to uh, get a little bit, because I know I've heard that a lot. Our desserts, he's eating. Like, who is that? And I never bothered to look it up. But anyway, for those who may not have known, so that's why he keeps mentioning that Artaxerxes edict happened happened in 457 BY. All right. So now this this point he's making here, I'm going to reread it. And if anybody wants to bring it out better or, or elucidate, go ahead. I'm going to reread this though. It must be remembered that the 2300 days of prophecy is a part of the 490 year period figured from the commandment going forth under Artaxerxes. For the body of Yahshua, excuse me, for the body of Yahshua is the temple or sanctuary of Yahweh that necessitated cleansing after being made sin for us. The resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, Elohim, was very early in the morning on Sunday or the 300th part of that thousand year day with Yahweh. So he's got this chart here. And you get your first, and remember, we're looking at 2300 days and and one of the things that helped me as I'm reading this and Yahweh is reminding me is you're looking at prophetic time and you're looking at time with Yahweh. So you're looking for 2,300 days. One day is as a thousand years. We've all, well, most of us have heard that for years. So you get your first thousand years on Friday. This is with Yahshua being crucified. First thousand years on Friday, Yahshua was crucified. This next thousand years is Saturday or the Sabbath, Yahshua at rest in Joseph's new tomb. And then the 300 years is Sunday. Elohim or Yahshua rose from the dead early in the morning. That equals 2,300 years, which equals the 2,300 days the sanctuary of Elohim was raised a glorified or spiritual body. So then he has it with Adam. And this was, uh, well, he's about to say this. This confused me. I'm going to go ahead and just read it and read this section. And then we'll, we can kind of go into it. With Adam, you have, 1,000 years, which equals one day with Adam, who was a figure of Yahshua, Nine, minus 930 years, which is the total lifespan of Adam. That leaves you 70 years, or the 700th part of the day that Adam lived. Excuse me, the 700th part of the day, Adam lived short of one day. So he's showing the 20, see here, 2,300 days with Adam as compared with Yahweh, Yahshua the Messiah, the second Adam. So... Can you go back up to that? Which which part? Right there. Um, the so, bottom. Nope, you're you're good right here. So the three hundred years, you know, the Sunday, mm -hmm. and it says you know it's three hundred because Yahshua rose from from the dead early in the morning. So does mm -hmm. that mean the three hundred is three hundred and not a thousand because it was not one full day that he was once again in the tomb? That's my understanding. Anybody want to take it? Yeah, the day the day went from six p um six p.m. to like six p.m. um it was dark to six a.m. in the morning, mm. and he rose at nine o'clock. And you have to get in to get those great day of Yahweh. You got to go to Genesis to see Genesis, the first chapter, to understand what is a day with Yahweh. Mm. So during that death. That Friday, you had a great day in that day where you had two days in one. Right. Mm -hmm. You see, because you it was dark when you said, go to Genesis 1, get Genesis 1. Let's do it. So I, I think you answered my question. So the 300 is because he didn't, he wasn't in the tomb the whole day. 
He came he was out of the tomb the early day. in the morning. Yeah, not that Sunday. No. Okay. Yeah, he he he, he, he woke on the third hour. You know, zeros have no significance, so it'd be like right. over three hundred. Right. Okay. Right. Does that See, help? You have you yeah. have that phenomenal you have that phenomenal day that's giving right. you three days that two days right. at one. But you also have to remember this: if Yahshua would have remained in the heart of the earth for three days, three full days, then that would have made the resurrection on the fourth day. And that's wow. out of, it can't happen like that. Mm -hmm. So that's out of step. So you have to have the third part of the day because that phenomenal day counted for two days. Joshua resurrected on the third day. Now, what happened on the third day of the creation? Right, we're going to get into that. It's coming right. up. Okay. <laughs> it's coming up. And that's the, that's the thing that... um. Like I said, when Dr. Dye suggested read the textbook, <laughs> I, it was like a facepalm moment. Like, yeah, it's right there. Dr. Kinley explains all of this. And it's the 2300 days is, this is what I, I, I look for. And I should have probably said this at the beginning. But Dr. Kinley covers it in this preamble to this section. I always look for like, what's the overall point that he's making? What is the gist of it? Because it's easy to get lost in the weeds with all these calculations for some people. Some people can work right through it. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But what I'm saying is the, the major point of 2300 days that I now see is that it's showing Yahshua fulfilling the scriptures. It's showing Yahshua and, and it ties in with his death, burial, and resurrection. He ties it with Jonah. He ties it with the days of creation. He ties it in with all of that. It's further witness and further proof that Yahshua was the promised Messiah. And that the steps of a righteous man are ordered, and he's going according to the things that were already prophesied of him before he came in the world. So I see you, Doctor Dye. Go ahead. You got something? Okay. You just you should, should pull it back up to that paragraph and read that last paragraph again about the one what, what you were looking at. I can't. Let me see where you were at. Uh, the, on page forty-seven, it uh -huh. must be remembered the twenty-three hundred days. Read that paragraph again. All right. Yes. It must be remembered that the 2300 days of prophecy is a part of the 490 year period figured from the now, commandment. Now you're talking about, you, you're going to have to slow down. You're talking about a 490 year period. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a particular time and ages and dispensation. And the previous speakers have mentioned certain things. And what we're talking about, we're talking about basically we're dealing with the time that Israel was going to be in captivity and that was 30, 70 years and you were dealing with Daniel receiving a vision and revelation during that time and when he talks about this 2300 days that we're talking about so you got this Friday which is 1000 because one day with Yahweh adds a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day right. now Yahshua the Messiah is Yahweh incarnated in the body so we got a couple of things going on here in the prophecies when you look at it. Because Yahshua, back in the realm of eternity, is like the principle is that one day with Yahweh is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So six days is like six thousand years and the Sabbath, rest of the Sabbath is like seven thousand years. But that takes all, all take place in the realm of eternity and that's with Yahweh. So you got Friday with Yahweh, that's like 1,000. Because he's setting up a prophecy that's going to point you to Yahshua the Messiah. Right. And like Saturday, that's one day with Yahweh is 1,000 years. And Saturday is one day with Yahweh is 1,000 years. And, and that's Saturday. See? And if you take the 1,000, which would be the another 1,000, so 1,000, 1,000, and 1,000 would be 3,000, right? That's mm -hmm. what you're looking at. So, but if you divide that up by, let's say, 10, you'd have, you know, 10. So 300 part of that, of the 1,000 year day, will leave 700, right. if you understand what I'm saying. Right. So because yeah. he resurrects very early in the morning, on the third day, you understand? That's compared to the 300 part of a day. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's what you're looking at. Right. So when you look at this prophecy, you have Cyrus and Darius, who is a part of the Medes and Persians. 
when you go to your Daniel chart and you look at that. You're looking at the Babylonian captivity and you're looking at the time that Jerusalem is going to be released, which is going to be 70 years, and they're going to have to go back and rebuild the temple. So you're looking at a particular temple. That's Zerubbabel's temple. See, it's on a 490-year cycle that you're talking about when you get back to reading the calculation. You understand? So what he's dealing with, he's dealing with a time fixed by Yahweh to dedicate a temple. So when you read that, it must be remembered. Go ahead and read on. All right. Yeah, we're going to get back to reading this. We're going to come back to the calculations, guys. We're going to come back to them, but we want to, I want to get through this text of it. It must be remembered. Okay, I just got a little bit more to say about that. Go ahead. It must be remembered that the 2300 days of prophecy is a part of the 490 year period. Figured from the command. No, you need to pause there. Because this 490 year period is going to be from the time of Zerubbabel's temple to the time of Yahshua the Messiah, which is going to be the spiritual temple. See? But go ahead. From the commandment going forth under, under Artaxerxes, for the body of Yahshua mm -hmm. the Messiah is the temple and, excuse me, or a sanctuary of Yahweh that necessitated cleansing after being made yes. sin for us. Correct. Go ahead. The resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah, Elohim, was very early in the morning on Sunday, or the 300th part of that thousand-year day with Yahweh. So he's saying it's the 300th part of a thousand-year day, see? And that's what you're looking at, because the prophecies concerning Yahweh is one day as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Right. So that's the 300. And he's going to go back into the days of creation and repeat that. That's very early in the morning on the third day. Right, right, so, right. And yeah, that's what, 24 hours. that's what that's what we're going to just keep reading because Dr. Kinley explains this. He explains uh, the time period that he's using. I want to get his words and then we're going to come back and allow everybody to elucidate. Okay, Doc, I'm not going to interrupt you anymore. No, no worries. I appreciate the input. Uh, all right. The 2300 days with Adam as compared with Yahweh, Yahshua the Messiah, the second Adam. Here we can understand that where the breath of life left Adam, excuse me, here we can understand that where the breath of life left the body of Adam, this is the instant Yahshua the Messiah, Elohim, raised from the dead, redeeming or reconciling the world unto himself, or abolishing death and bringing life and immortality to light. 1,000 years is one day with Yahweh, minus the 700 years, the 700th part of the one day which Adam lived short of a thousand, these 300 years or the 300 part of the one day in which Elohim rose from the dead. I know that stumped me. I had to read that about 10 times. So somebody want to explain that? Does everybody see what he's saying there? How do actually, you, how Dorian, you... for me, that actually helped understand. Oh. That actually helped answer my question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody okay. else confused, as confused by that as I was? <laughs> But I get it now. He's saying that Yahshua, the instant, you can understand that where the breath of life left the body of Adam, this is the instant Yahshua, the Messiah, raised from the dead. Does everybody see that? Go ahead, Dr. Doc. If you total the 700 and the 300 in that, you get what? A thousand year day. Right. And if you broke it down in hundreds, you'd have the 300 part of that day. Mm -hmm. Now, that's why he's fulfilling that 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 930. He's taking the 30, mm -hmm. using 30, see, and he's subtracting that from that, as we say, that 1,000, see. Right, he right. It out. You see, and, and, and where Adam, the instance Adam died, that was typical of he's going to tell you that's the 300 part of the day. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where Yahshua resurrected. Right. At that same instance that he died and fulfilled. Right. I thought that was pretty neat. At first, I didn't get it. I'm like, what? But yeah, the same time Adam dies 70 years short, Yahshua raises at the 300th part of the day. That's your thousand year day. He's picking them up right where he fell. 
that's pretty slick to me. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, we got uh, 2,300 days as related to the three days of creation. You get your first thousand on the first day of creation, cosmic light in darkness, earth is in state of death. The second thousand comes from the second day of creation, the earth buried or baptized in water, the waters are parted. Then the 300 comes from the third day of creation, the seed of vegetation raised up, figurative of the seed of Abraham, Yahshua the Messiah, showing the reflection even in the vegetable kingdom. That equals 2,300 days, which is the death, burial, and resurrection. And pay attention to this phrase as he uses it a lot, or new life state. So the 2,300 days of the death, burial, and resurrection, or new life state of the earth. And we, we're going to get to these charts. So, so he's just giving examples, just how this 2,300 days is repeating. And if you recall in that lecture we listened to last week, that's what he talked about. He said, I can take 490 and run it all the way down from, from, from the beginning of the creation all the way to Yashem Sai, all the way down. So that's what he's doing here with these uh, in this section. 20, the 2,300 days as related to the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt by Moses. You get your first thousand. The day Moses and the Israelites leave Egypt, cosmic light or the cloud is in darkness or night or early morning of April 15th. The Israelites in state of death and bondage under Pharaoh. You get your second thousand years. The day Israel reached the Red Sea and is buried or baptized in the cloud and in the sea. The waters are parted. And then you get the 300, the resurrection from the dead or from Egypt coming into new life. There's that phrase again. The 2300 day, 2300 is the death, burial, and resurrection or new life state of the Israelites from Egypt to the wilderness. Dorian, I'm sorry. So, so the 300 on that one, they, so they came through the Red Sea when they finally made it to the other side. It was the first part of that, that day, that morning, or I don't and understand it, at 300 there. Yeah, those are the questions I had too, so go ahead. I heard somebody, go ahead. I said correct that is that's that part that 300 part of the day ain't nothing changing okay okay thank you Philip. let me say this what he'll do you have those days of creation and that's what you're looking at and if you can kind of follow that along see and he's talking about the first day and he's talking about the second day. First day, he divided the light from the darkness. Right? Because the sun's coming in on the fourth day. That's cosmic light. He's saying that because it's, or it's the light of life. <laughs> or it's, it's not incandescent, sunlight, mm -hmm. red light, uh, mercury vapor, any kind of light like that. This is a light, this is Yahshua, the light of the world. This is Yahshua flashing, and that eliminates the darkness. So that's, and the prophecy is one day with Yahweh is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Right. So when we get to, there's a phenomenal day in the land of Egypt. When he devised, when he, when Israel's got light, and the mm. Egyptians are in darkness, that's mm. unusual. This is the phenomenal light. That cosmic light is phenomenal light. Then you get the second day. He's got to divide the waters above from the waters beneath. So you're looking at the Red Sea being divided. You see that cloud that did that. And very early in the morning on the third day, see, the children in resurrected unto new life. See, and you have that third day, you have the seed of vegetation resurrected. But you're still looking at the prophecy, one day with Yahweh is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's what right. you're dealing with, the same right. principle. Right, that, that's, that's something. Dorian. Yes, sir. Didn't the children of Abraham, or the, the seed of Abraham, resurrect 
uh, somewhere in that timeline also during with the comparison to the migration of the Israelites? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. Them, I'll, I'll read it again. That's right. correct. Right. He takes the whole seed of Israel, the seed right. of Abraham, which is the Israelites as a whole. They resurrect very early in the morning of the third day. Right. And that's this right here, what we just read. Uh, the that's death, burial, resurrection, right. or new life state life, life, of the life, Israelites. Life. Of the Israelites right. from Egypt to the wilderness. So that's the seed of Abraham resurrecting. Just like the seed. You just, you just didn't say seed of Abraham, but I just thought it should, I, I right. clarified that it was the seed of Abraham. Right. Thank you, Pedro. Yeah. That's just like the seed right. of vegetation on the yes. third day. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. One quick thing. I think what we're where we're getting sidetracked a little bit is is what we're trying to do is we're trying to take regular carnal time and trying to dig for and find out how it relates to prophetic time. Well, it doesn't. You, we can't take prophetic time that Dr. Kimmich is talking about here. It's 2,300 days, it's prophetic time, and you're not gonna fix it to a, a clock, a physical clock that we use now. Because Dr. Kimmich makes one point. On that 300th part of the day, when Yasser was resurrected, that darkness was abolished. So there was no more night after that. At the doctor, after Joshua the Messiah resurrects, outpours his Holy Spirit, that darkness is abolished. So that not only is that 300th part of the day, a third day, but it's a day, it's an eternal day also because darkness is abolished and you are in the light until eternity in Yahshua the Messiah. So we don't need to be struggling past that 300th part of the day. Well, I, I'll say this. Awesome. I'll say this. I appreciate that. We're going to do what Dr. Kinley said. We're sweating it out. So everybody it took, okay. as I'm reading this over this week, since we listened to that lecture, I, it took a while to, for y'all. I mean, Yahweh had to, reveal it to me you're dealing with prophetic time so if you keep that in mind that helps but it was it was a struggle and you know it's, sometimes it's a struggle for people so we're just trying to sweat it out i want people to ask their questions until you know they can work their mind around to it but that that is what you said dr lewis and dr Dye. that is true keep in mind that we're dealing with prophetic time time is set by yahweh if you keep it like that that i know that helped me a lot if you keep that in your mind dealing with the 2300 days the one day is a thousand years as set by yahweh and also as dr uh philip crook just put in the chat it's over in genesis where uh, what yahweh called the daylight or uh, yeah in the darkness he called night so then also we're going to read exodus 14 and 20 through 24 go ahead lauren read that exodus 14 and 20 and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. Mm -hmm. And the and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch Yahweh looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire, and of the cloud and trouble the host of the Egyptians. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh, I see somebody. Watch. Huh? Uh, the morning watch that helped for me. Okay. All right. I see like somebody's there's a question to yeah, yeah, I can't Clarissa. see who, who is it. Oh, okay, go ahead. Clarissa. Hey, I, I hate to do this, but when you if you scroll back up to the uh Moses, uh, no, not Moses, with uh Adam and Yahshua, mm -hmm. I get that that statement where he died. Um, where is it? Where he where it talks about he died, or he as soon as Adam died, mm -hmm. that piece of it. I get it mm -hmm. mathematically, 
I get the mathematic part of it. Mm -hmm. But what I don't get is that that statement. I can't find it. Um, I got it right here on the screen. It is uh, it's at the top of page 48. And I understand what you mean, because that's what I was like. Wait, what? And it's, right. it's actually you want me to read okay. it again? Yeah, I see it now. This is the instant Yashua the Messiah raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. That's that's the part I, I don't. Right, right. So it's actually what the dean just said is that we're thinking physical, natural time. That is prophetically speaking. He's speaking in prophetic terms. Time with Yahweh. That is the instant. He picked up Adam. Where Adam died 70 years short of that day, Yahshua raises that 300th prophetically speaking that's the okay. same time he picks them up but it's not like you know yeah there was what four thousand years between that <laughs> you know what i'm saying right, right physical okay. time. he's not talking about physical time though okay, okay. can i, can yeah, I elaborate ahead. like once again with that genesis one and five like they say when you read that you you have to understand that the night begins the day you see hmm. so so it wasn't complete. It was the night was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. You right. had your complete half of the day. But when he resurrected, he resurrected like around the nine o'clock hour, which would be like a three, but it's not the complete day of the light day, but part of the light day. Mm -hmm. So that's why you're getting that 300 part where you know where it's a thousand. That's why you're breaking it down. So we can understand that it'd be like that. That's where you get the 300. Because when you have light and darkness, you got one day. So you get that great day of Yahweh when he went on the cross at nine and then he gave up the ghost at 12. It became dark. It was dark from six to 12 and then 12 o'clock to three o'clock. I mean, it was light from six to 12 and then dark from 12 to three. Mm -hmm. Then back to 3 p.m. it went light again to 6 p.m. See, mm -hmm. that's how those two great days in one day on that Friday. Right. 6 p.m. starts it starts the day. And so when you get to 6 a.m., when the sun comes back up, you know, and at that 900 hours, or that um, that's like three, that third hour, he resurrected. So, but you gotta understand the prophetic time. If you're looking for 24 hours or 72 right. hours, you're right. not gonna get it. Right. You got, that's right. why it's good. You gotta understand when he say. He had the light and day, that's one day. When you got right. darkness and light, that's one day with Yahweh. Right. Thank you, Dr. Quirk. So is that helping? Because that's what I'm, uh, is, is this helping everybody? Can I have you read some, thing? Doc? Yeah, just give me one second, Dr. I Doc. think it's like Psalm 26. Dr. Doc. Doc. Dr. Doc, just give me one second, please. Is this right, helping Dr. everybody Dr. that we, we're trying to just take the time and go through these things? Yes. I want everybody yes. to open it. Yes. Take your exactly. time. Ask your questions. Yes. I would have never understood this. So yes, yes, right. yes. I was told right. to hear this. Hallelujah. And thank you. Hi, Rochelle. <laughs> Can we also say, I mean, if, but in this equation, we have to also remember that the scriptures talks about is 12 hours in a day. Now we're dealing with um, figures here. And I think that's what Felicia was asking, kind of sort of, is because you're looking at this complete day but keep in mind what that day actually is what Yahweh has said and like uh, Dr. Lewis was saying um, this um, looking at it prophetically is where we're kind of I know for me it's hard to kind of try to extract the physical way of calculating it mm -hmm. but I think that 12 hour day has something to do with the two I'm not we're sure gonna, we're gonna we're gonna get to that we're going to get to that as we read. That's why I want to really stick with reading this. But um, Dr. Dye, go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. And then we'll get back to reading. Oh, okay, Doc. I just want you to read like uh, Psalms 90 and 4. Psalms, uh, yeah, that is. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, read, please. Psalms 90, <clears throat> excuse me, and 4. For a thousand years in the sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And as they watch in the night. Yes, you got like Second Peter three and eight. Second Peter three and eight. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing: that one day is with Yahweh as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. So that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with Yahweh Elohim incarnated in a body, and that's the prophecy that he's using. So you're talking about a particular time. You have, as we would say, you have what we call the uh, one day with a year. That may be prophetic time. Uh, one day with Yahweh is a thousand years, mm-hmm. you see. And then you have a day for a year. See, so those prophecies are being used in a particular way. So if you go back to the creation, that's one day with Yahweh is a thousand years. Well, who's creating that? Yahweh Elohim. Mm-hmm. See? And Yahweh is Yahweh Elohim in the body. See? In his ministry, he's fulfilling. When Yahweh's fulfilling in his ministry, he's filling a day for a year. And you'll have that on page 97 when he talks about that in volume one of your textbooks. That's what you're looking at. So this prophecy that we're dealing with is one day with Yahweh is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day as is fulfilled by Yahshua in his death, burial, resurrection. Right, right. He's resurrect the quickening spirit. He's Elohim in a body. That's what you're looking at. And that's why you keep coming up with this 1,000, 1,000, 1,300 part of a day. Right, right. That's the prophecy yeah. that he's... He's repeating here. One day with Yahweh right. is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Yes, fulfilling. We right. know other prophets. That's specifically dealing with his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, Doc. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Doc. Uh, I see you, uh, John and Myra. Got something? Um, I had a um, question, kind of comment, kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. In looking at this, um, I know it says um, that Yahshua Messiah uh, resurrected when um, the breath of life left the body of Adam. And in reading this section, Yahshua Messiah is picking mankind up um, in his heart and in his mind. Mm-hmm. So Adam, when he died spiritually, so psychologically i mean he says over in, on the next page that adam uh, died in his conscious or soul and i know we're we're looking at the 2300 days because it's talking about the death and resurrection but yash messiah is picking mankind up psychologically and spiritually so he's not picking mankind up physically so he's right. picking picking us up Talks about the body of Yash Messiah being cleansed. It's being cleansed by the gospel being preached. But um, I, I just really wanted to kind of bring that out so that um, we don't forget that we're not talking about a, anything physical here. We're talking about the soul of a man being right. generated or, or resurrected or being um, picked up and brought into a new life state or um, as as is termed in this uh, section. Doc Kelly, he always brings out the spiritual reality in all these sections. It might not be like uh, a whole big long uh, two, three, four paragraphs. It might be like a sentence or two, but he's always bringing out the, about the reality and um, I just wanted to point that out so we won't lose uh, sight of what we're. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Doctor Doctor Quakes. That's what I, I'm. I'm sure this is the last time I'm going to interrupt you. Mm-hmm. Being here, now I I know what you're trying to do, and I think we're all looking for the same thing. And I think now, if we, everyone that's listening now except for the person that reading. I think our responsibility now is since we're sure, I know me personally, I'm still unsure about many things about this. Uh, if we all just take notes now, digest the information that's being placed out here, that's being read, take notes to ourselves, and between now and the next session that we go over this, just take a moment and try to understand as much of what you can understand and what you don't understand should in sit and do some questions, some fruitful questions that we can ask at a later date in a question and answer session. But right now, I think it'd be best for all of us if we just let you, Dorian, or whoever's going to read, go through the information and put the information 
information out there so we can digest that as of right now. That's all I have. All right. All right. I saw, uh, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to get back to reading. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. I want to get, uh, sometimes we need to bring these points out too, though. Um, yeah, just stick to the agenda, as Marvin said, and we'll, uh, no one can pick all this up without having. Right. 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 We're going to, yeah, that, that's what we're going we're gonna to have to do. That'll be best know? that we get through it and then come back for the feedback. Right. The questions. Okay. All right. I do want to get Rhonda. I saw Rhonda. You you were unmuted. You got something? I'm going to wait and let you finish as um, was admonished just, just now. So okay. just to keep down a lot of the confusion, I'm going to wait and let you finish with the okay. reading. All okay. right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Brazil. All right. Uh, so we started right here. We left off right here. Still further proof in the scriptures as related to Jonah. You get your first thousand years, uh, one day into the sea. Jonah was one day into the sea. The second thousand comes from one day Jonah in the belly of a fish. And the 300 is the 300th part of the day. Then Jonah is cast ashore. 2300 equals three days being the only sign given. That's Matthew 12 and 40, mm -hmm. which was already stated in prophecy. Uh, 862 years before Yahshua. So 2,300 days of prophecy or years with Yahweh minus the 457 BY, that's Artaxerxes commandment that we talked about, leaves you with 1843 AD or 1844 if you count the half years as a full one. This date is in years after the birth of Yahshua the Messiah. So now he's about to explain that. So I know there's going to be some questions. The above is considered, let's talk about this, the above is considered and held as fact by some of Christendom that this 1843-1844 is the date when Yahshua entered into the most holy place through the second veil in the presence of Yahweh. This is in grave error, for if that be the case, then it means that the world was yet in its sins for 1810 years after Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which event could only have happened when the sanctuary of the prophecy was cleansed or the body of Yahshua the Messiah, which was made to be sin for us, was accepted by Yahweh in, for the remission of sins at that time. Everybody got that? I know I had to read that about 10 times. <laughs> so what he's saying is they're wrong because the um, Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit couldn't happen until the sanctuary was cleansed. That's what he's saying. So that's why they're wrong. They got it backwards. Like that couldn't even have. They're saying that <clears throat> uh, Yahshua or the cleansing of the sanctuary, the 2300 days happened after Pentecost. And he's like, it couldn't happen. It, it, the cleansing of the sanctuary has to happen before Pentecost. Hope that makes sense. All right. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, said that Yahshua the Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. Then for 40 days after his resurrection, he tarried on earth before he ascended. For Yahshua is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of Yahweh for us. All right. Unto 2300 days, then the, shall the sanctuary be cleansed, and that one day with Yahweh is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. We just read that, Psalms 90 and 4, 2 Peter 3 and 8. As compare and apply elsewhere in the scriptures, pointing to the Messiah, Adam, the creation, the Israelites, Jonah, and reconfirmed by Peter's imprisonment and release in AD 43 or 10 years to the date after the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. It is necessary for understanding to retain these cardinal points of the correlation of the first and second Adam and of the three days and three nights of the death, burial, and spiritual resurrection of Yahshua. So, all right, I'm gonna keep reading uh, so much. I don't really know how to deal with these, these diagrams. We'll come back to these. I'm going to keep reading. 
because that point that he made there, he says, continue on page 49. I don't want to lose that point. So I'm going to read this again and jump down to 49. It is necessary for understanding to retain these cardinal points of the correlation of the first and second atom and of the three days and three nights of the death, burial, and spiritual resurrection of Yahshua. All right. These are the cardinal points he's saying is necessary to retain. The first one, the true sanctuary to which the 2300-day prophecy related was the physical body of Yahshua, in whom Yahweh Elohim manifested himself to physical Israel. Number two, that the Mosaic tabernacle and the tab and excuse me, and the temple that Solomon built were figures, types, or shadows of his physical and incorporeal body. And uh, Dr. Kinley said that in the lecture we listened to last week. He said that the tabernacle represented Yahshua in his physical body, and the temple resurrected his super incorporeal body. All right. Three, that in the creation, Elohim called the light day and the darkness he called night. We just read that. That the light of, excuse me, number four, that the light of life was going out in that sanctuary or his physical body during the time that the light of the golden candlestick was out in the sanctuary or temple. Five, that Yahshua represented the goat for sin offering and also the scapegoat. In fact, all sacrifices meet their fulfillment in Yahshua the Messiah, because as it is said, sacrifices and burnt offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Six, that the light in the sanctuary of the temple was snuffed out at 9 a.m., and it remained out till 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Further, that the sacrifice was offered up twice during the day at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m., and pointed to Yahshua. So remember, these are all points that he's saying we have to remember to understand this. Seven, that Adam, after his transgression, was driven out of the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day by an angel with a flaming sword. Eight, that Yahshua was crucified during what is termed daylight, beginning at 9 a.m. It began to gradually grow dim, the light of the day diminishing to the twilight of evening till noon. So from 9 a.m. to noon, it was getting dark. We've heard about this phenomenal day. At 12 noon, it then turned dark over the face of the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour, or from 12 noon to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. This phenomenal darkness is the same as the Stingian darkness in Egypt during the plague of death at the time of Passover, being in the shadow of the death of Yahshua, who is our Passover. So he's got a diagram here explaining, or they're showing this. Friday, dawn to 9 a.m. is light or day. That's the phenomenal day. Or here's the phenomenal day. 9 a.m. to 12 noon is twilight evening. 12 noon to 3 p.m. is dawn again, or light or day. That's on Friday. Then on Friday, you have the regular day. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. It begins to get light again. So on the light, that means it's day. Uh, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., you have twilight, a regular night. It's getting dark like a regular day into the evening. And then 9 p.m. till dawn is darkness or night. And then Saturday is a regular one day, one night. This gives you the total of three days and three nights of Matthew 12 and 40. The resurrection was during the very early dawn of the new day the first day of the week, Sunday morning, Saturday being the Sabbath day. By using the direct pattern of the time element associated with the daily internal priestly functions of the temple, starting with the outer court. I'm sorry, <laughs> this is a, another thing that Yahweh helped me see. I just wanna say this, I forgot or I wasn't recognizing. See those cardinal points that he talked about, we have to keep in mind, we need to keep uh, like he talked about that day equals light or light equals day and darkness equals night. We're dealing with prophetic time. These are the things we got to keep in mind. The, the time with Yahweh, not with man. Also that he's, he's um, correlating it to the tabernacle. So 
when he starts talking about it, we should have in our head the tabernacle, most holy place, holy place, court roundabout, something like that. We should be thinking about that because he's using that. He's going by this pattern. So I'll start this over. By using the direct pattern of the time element associated with the daily internal priestly functions of the temple, starting with the outer court. So you see, he's going by this pattern. The morning sacrifice was offered up at 9 a.m. in the morning which also was the morning hour of prayer. At this time, 9 a.m., the priest went into the holy place or sanctuary to perform the services of Yahweh Elohim. The next sacrifice was not offered up until 3 p.m. in the afternoon, which also was the afternoon hour of prayer. The division between these two periods may be denoted by the hour of prayer at 12 noon at which time no sacrifice was offered for any atonements, atonement or sins. So you see he's going by the pattern. He says he's starting in the outer court. Then he talks about the division between these two periods being the 12 noon hour of prayer. That's the veil or the door. So now dealing with the now in dealing with the sanctuary of either the Mosaic tabernacle or the Herodian temple, we find that at the same time of the daily sacrifice, the priest also had to fulfill his sac sacerdotal priestly functions unerringly with the golden candlestick of the most of the holy place. At the 9 a.m. sacrifice, the candlestick was extinguished, extinguished. And at the same time, its reservoirs were refilled to their capacity with pure beaten olive oil. At the 3 p.m. sacrifice, the candlestick was relit again to burn all through the night, extinguishing all darkness in the sanctuary. Excuse me. This candlestick was lit at all times with the exception of the time that it was out from the hours of 9, a.m., 9 in the morning till 3 in the afternoon. This favorably, this favorably compared with Friday that phenomenal day at the crucifixion in which it turned dark from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., showing the light of life being extinguished in that sanctuary of the prophecy or the temple of his body. Everybody with us so far? <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Now, taking the body of Yahshua hanging on the cross and comparing this to the sanctuary, or temple and to the priestly services therein, of which everything pointed to, it is easily discerned that as the light of life, which is the blood, was draining out of his body from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, that same day, Friday, and he was in the last stages of his physical life from 12 noon to 3 p.m., or where the Stygian darkness was across the face of the earth in the greater and more perfect, perfect tabernacle. As the light was out in the sanctuary from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., so also was the light dying out or being extinguished in his body or the true sanctuary during the same hours of that same day, Friday, the evening of which the Jewish Sabbath began. The transitional light or time from 9 a.m. to 12 noon also shows the psychological death which took place in the conscience of the first man, Adam, in the Garden of Eden, from the time that he disobeyed the commandment of Yahweh Elohim to the time that he was expelled from the garden. So we got to look at these plates. Um, being cast out in the cool of the day or as the sun was going down and the evening shadow and darkness came upon the face of the earth. This casting out into the outer court, plate 15E, which casting out completes the pattern from 12 noon to 3 p.m., represents the blood finally draining out of that body and the, and the fulfillment of total death. Now, I, I want to look at these diagrams. So he said plate 15E. Anybody want to add something to that? Anybody want to? I think we need a little break from the reading. Anybody want to? Got any comments to go with us? I um, I wanted to to piggyback on what Dr. Myra Quates pointed out, talking about recognizing 
the spiritual aspect of Adam's death in his conscience and where Yahshua picked him up, um, not just being that physical body death. Mm -hmm. Um, Because if you remember any time that we brought these things out in, in this teaching, we talked about how Adam died in the day, both spiritually and psychologically and physically, okay? Mm. Instantaneously in that garden, when he touched that fruit, he died instantaneously that same solar day. That death is the spiritual psychological death that occurred. Mm-hmm. And he also died within the 1,000 year day with Yahweh happening, as is pointed out in the Elohim book here, 70 years shy. He died at 930 years, 70 years shy of a 1,000 year day with Yahweh. So he's operating both of those through Adam at the same time, same solar day, psychologically and spiritually prophetic day his physical body has to hit the ground Mm. within 1000 years so this cool of the evening that we just read about is also reflecting the 700th part of the day where Yahweh waited to the cool of the evening to drive the man out or as it's going down into darkness remember we always Rehearse this as that sun in the sky is going down. Adam, the first created son of Yahweh, is also going down. He's being expelled out of that garden. Mm -hmm. That's that 700th part of the day. And that's where Yahshua, because as the sun's going down, remember, Mm -hmm. S-U-N is correlating to S-O-N. Yash Messiah picks him up at that moment. So he is sunrise, S O N coming up, and S U N reflecting the same thing in the what he calls the 300th part of the day, which is the remainder of that full 1,000 year day with Yahweh. So you got a full day. And it's on the elementary chart where Adam coming down out of the garden is the plate that's right above the death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua Messiah. So it's literally a round trip. Adam's coming down, the first man, Adam. The second man, Adam's coming up in that one complete full day with Yahweh, 1,000 year day. So, I mean, it's, um, that's all I want to say. Dorian, are you saying something? We can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Brazil. And, uh, that actually brings us to this diagram that, uh, we were trying to do uh, that we kind of skipped over. So I appreciate everyone bearing with us. I really don't know what to do with the diagrams. I don't know if explaining them helps or not, but as it's already been said, this is, you're going to have to study this on your own. We're trying to go through some of these things. I do want to read this caption he has under this, because this is talking about what Dr. Brazil just said. So he's showing the 2300 days shown in the fall of Adam and redemption in Yahshua the Messiah by the pattern. And he's got these plates. Um, they're not numbered. I know Dr. Dodd knows what, what numbers these are, but uh, I can pull them up on the chart if you guys want me to, the, the better chart where you can see better. But he has here, the first man, Adam. Plate 15 is a, a transgression. Plate okay. 31 okay. that very resurrection. Okay, well, well, we'll pull them up after I read this, if you guys want to pull them up and look at them. The first man, Adam, a figure of the second Adam, Yahshua the Messiah. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden, the most holy place. So we see it here. 
by transgression, he died that day in his conscience and was driven out in cool of the day as the sun was going down in, into outer darkness, outer court. So this is what Dr. Brazil was just explaining. All right. 1,000 years equals one day with Yahweh. 930 years is Adam's lifespan. 70 years or 700th part of the day Adam lived. 300 days short of a thousand year day with Yahweh Elohim. And he made that point uh, very strenuously in that lecture we listened to. He said the thousand year day, that's the time with Yahweh. He said, I did not say the man. That's with Yahweh. So just one of those points to keep in, keep in mind. The second Adam, Yahshua the Messiah, was made to be the sin offering in the outer court. Excuse me, in the outer court for the atonement of sin inflicted upon man by the first man, Adam. He was crucified, buried, and resurrected early Sunday morning, the third day, as the sun was rising, rending the veil in the temple, and was seated on the right hand of the throne of Yahweh 40 days thereafter. 1,000 years is Friday, Yahshua was crucified. Second 1,000 years is Saturday, Yahshua rested in the tomb. And 300 is 300 years or early Sunday morning. 2,300 years or 2,300 days, the Messiah resurrected. The sanctuary is cleansed. So hopefully that helps. You guys want me to keep on? You want me to pull up that charter? They probably could see it better. Right, Pitch probably they help them once they see them being driven out. Probably get the uh, use that uh, elementary chart. Yeah, you rather use that one? Yeah, you got, yeah. You got it right I on top of the point I never thought about. Okay, all right, here we go. So you got them right on top uh, of each other. Elementary chart. It's up. You'll see it in a minute. <laughs> okay, doc. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she brought something to mind that had never even dawned on me. It's uh, this transgression plate. If you're dealing with the, we got two plates. One of them's called transgression. Another one's called division between male and female. In the creation, the sixth day is still one day with always a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The psychological death that we talk about, we say that man died in his consciousness on that day. When then we say, you see the sun in the background? Right. In the holy place? Some pictures there in the lower part, they have a moon in that section down there in the court roundabout. So on this solar, this is not, when Adam's in a garden, before the transgression, he's still in an eternal day. Never thought about that in the mm -hmm. comparative analysis. Mm -hmm. When he's driven out of this garden by the pattern, he goes down into darkness. That's dealing with the death of Yahshua the Messiah. At the bottom, you see that circle around him and the crucifixion mm. bearer. That's the darkness. Right. So now, from the time that the sun goes down into darkness, then the next day that it rises, that's one day. Mm -hmm. And him, when him at his, he's carnally minded then. He's going down into death. See, but he's but when that transgression happened, it's not a solar day. If you understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. You don't get a solar day until the sun rises the right. next day, you can start your count. Right. And that never came to mind to me. And from the time that he started to count. In the court roundabout or in the earth plane, it was 930 years. So if Yahshua's fulfilling like the day of eternity back here, because there's other things going on in this plate, and you're doing it by the pattern of the tabernacle, 
you understand and he's talking about the time sequence he's comparing that to the priest officiating in the tabernacle and the lighting and snuffing out of the candlestick that's what he's doing in the mm -hmm. sense that he's coming that he's coming down into death into darkness and Yahshua is fulfilling that, but Yahshua is coming up from darkness into light. The right. darkness is in the court roundabout. The semi-light, the morning light, or the evening light is in the holy place. You know, that transition. And the light is in the most holy place. So mm -hmm. Adam is coming from the light, coming on down to the veil, to the holy place, the snuffing out of that, as we say, depends on where you're looking at that the candlestick is now it's been snuffed out and filled right and it's going to be lit again yeah he's coming down and the messiah's coming up at the same place that adam went down into darkness right see the messiah's coming from darkness back to light mm -hmm. and he's dealing with 2300 days so adam's coming down and yashua's going up and Adam, so if, when Adam gets into the darkness, that's what Joshua really quickens him at out of that darkness in his consciousness. But that's not going to be truly reflected because there's other things being fulfilled in that plate. It's not truly going to be reflective until the day of a Pentecost. See, when Yahshua's, Yahshua comes up, he's ending, as we would say, the, the post-Diluvian age. And, but he still has to fulfill the, and what happens is at the time that he resurrects, also all the sons that have died from Adam all the way down to John the Baptist, we might say, that believed on the coming of the Messiah, they also resurrect with him. See? So where he dies at, Dr. Dye, did we lose you? He resurrects that is the same place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the point that Dr. K Dr. Kinley was making. So I appreciate that, Dr. Dye. All right, you guys want to read a little bit more? And then uh, let's see. Where do we end up at? <laughs> All right. Okay. Where do we end at? <laughs> I'm sorry. Who's under that? I don't know. We did on page 49. Yeah, please, please, no. please no. Please no. That's where okay. All right. Don't That's what I thought. Me. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, poor fucking. Please note that as Adam, the first man and son of Yahweh Elohim, was going down, being the degenerator, even the son in the greater and more perfect tabernacle was also going down in the heaven. Compare this with the second Adam, Yahshua the Messiah, who in the power of his resurrection rose from the dead very early in the morning as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, showing that the son of Yahweh, as Malachi said, the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings, along with the son in the greater and more perfect tabernacle coming up together or regenerating the world to a new day and a new life. This immortal body in which the Messiah tarried for 40 days and nights in the holy place or the resurrection in the greater and more perfect tabernacle, appearing to his disciples 11 times before he ascended into the most holy place or heaven, brought life and immortality to light. Or as Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The resurrected form in which he tarried shows that our redemption, both of the conscious and of the body, was purchased by the blood of the Messiah, who offered himself without spot to Yahweh for us, as manifested in his ascension into heaven now to appear in the presence of Yahweh 
to make intercessions for us. All right. Analysis and summary of the, of the physical and spiritual temples. In the calculation of the 2300 days as pertaining to the cleansing of the sanctuary, our brethren, not having the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of all things spiritual, misunderstood and confused the temple of his body with the Herodian temple, in which the outer court, holy place or sanctuary, and most holy place was located. They did not, nor do they yet understand that the blood and physical body of Yahshua, according to the scriptures, took the place of the daily and yearly sacrifices, offerings, and gifts common to the outer court of the Herodian temple. How much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot or blemish to Yahweh, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? For this cause, he, Yahshua the Messiah, not Mary or the Pope, is the mediator, uh, excuse me, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yahshua the Messiah is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Yahweh for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world or the post-Diluvian age, hath he appeared to put away this, excuse me, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, for a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. It is therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The holy place and most holy place of the Herodian temple stood as a figure of his body, which was the temple or the sanctuary of Yahweh. The New Testament did not come into effect till that body, which took on the likeness of sinful flesh, was cleansed. He appeared in the presence of Yahweh himself for us in 33 AD, or he entered into the most holy place at that time, cleansed, as did all the high priests who officiated in the Herodian temple. He did not enter into the most holy place or into the presence of Yahweh for us in the year 1844 AD, for this was, would have left the world in its sins for a period of 1810 years after the heavenly or angelic and earthly creatures had been redeemed by the shedding of his blood and sin had been abolished. For Yahshua, our Passover, was sacrificed for us in AD 33. As the, excuse me, as the Levitical priest, excuse me, as the Levitical high priest on the day of atonement, when he offered the blood or sprinkled it seven times toward the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place before the presence of Yahweh, witnessed the lightning of the Shekinah within the cloud between the wings of the cherubim, so also did the apostles witness the same event as the sun began to rise in the greater and more perfect tabernacle or temple, and also as the sun of righteousness arose in their hearts on the day of Pentecost, when the light of the world was poured out or flashed as the spiritual form of the Holy Spirit. That's something. <laughs> the Gentiles were grafted into the kingdom of Yahweh by the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 40 AD, even while the Herodian temple yet still yet stood and have continued to be grafted in even after the temple had been torn down, destroyed by Titus in AD 70. It must be remembered that the Messiah entered into heaven itself and appeared before the presence of Yahweh before AD 70. And this was not in the Herodian temple, the Vatican, or any other building of brick, mortar, or stone. In fact, it includes no temple made with hands. The purpose of Yahweh is to gather all those that are in heaven 
and all those that are in earth into the one body of his son, Yahshua the Messiah. And since this is now a spiritual body, this plan could only be accomplished by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, who now dwells not in buildings made with hands, but in the temples of our bodies, which a holy nation and royal priesthood groweth into a holy temple in Yahweh for an habitation of Elohim through the spirit. Let me read that without the parentheses. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this is a long sentence. <laughs> Let me try to read this again without the parentheses. The purpose of Yahweh is to gather all those that are in heaven and all those that are in earth into one body of his son, Yahshua the Messiah. And since this is now a spiritual body, this plan could only be accomplished by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, who now dwells not in, in buildings made with hands, but in the temple of our bodies, which no man has built or erected. We know that the foundation for the Herodian temple was laid in 16 BY, and it was 46 years in the building at the time that Yahshua was baptized or went into his ministry in AD 30. Now, Dr. Kinley covered this last week in that lecture. However, the temple was in a condition whereby the Jews could hold their services in it before and during the ministry of Yahshua. For it is written in Matthew 21, 12 through 13, and Yahshua went into the temple of Yahweh and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Again, in Matthew 26, 55, in that same hour said Yahshua to the multitudes, are ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple and ye laid no hold on me. According to the prophecy of Daniel, this temple was also to be destroyed and the Jews would again undergo persecution and dispersion. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth and I came to show thee for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. Seventy weeks of years are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to restrain transgression and make an end of sin offerings and to make atonement for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to complete the prophetic vision and to anoint the holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off without a successor to follow him. And the people of the prince and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood and unto the end of war excuse me, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Instead, he shall cause the prevalence of, a, of an abominable idol that maketh desolate, even unto the destruction that is determined shall be poured out upon the desolator. Further prophecy is, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. This prophecy of Daniel concerning one, the destruction of the Herodian temple, and two, the dispersion of the Jews till the fullness of the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which was also confirmed by Yahshua in these words, and Yahshua went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Yahshua said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, another that shall not be thrown down. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled.
According to the prophecy of Daniel and the history of its fulfillment, the Herodian temple was completely demolished or destroyed on Friday, August 9th, AD 70, by the Roman emperor Titus, who invaded Jerusalem at that time. It was at this time when the daily sacrifice was taken away, that is, as far as the physical Jew was concerned, and the abomination of desolation was set up according to the prophecy of Daniel, mentioned by Yahshua in Matthew 24 and 15. Jer Jerusalem thereafter began to fall by the edge of the sword and was led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem was to be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled or until Yahshua, Elohim, is revealed from heaven. The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled is not to be confused with the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, in Romans 11 and 25. Because the fullness of the Gentiles be come in actually began to take place seven years after the day of Pentecost in AD 33, or in AD 40 and a half, or 41, when the apostle Peter was sent from Joppa to preach to the gospel to the Gentiles, Cornelius and his household, in the city of Caesarea. That's Acts the 10th and 11th chapters. But looking at the matter from the pure theological point of view, that is, the temple and the host shall be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, or until Yahshua the Messiah is revealed from heaven. Many Bible students of today look forward to the Jews returning to Palestine and rebuilding and and the rebuilding and dedication of the new physical temple to take place on this, presical, on this present physical earth plane. However, anthropologically speaking, as the Apostle Paul states in Romans 2 and 28 through 29, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and that circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Yahweh. For we are built upon the foundation of the prophets, apostles, and on Yahshua the Messiah himself, as Paul writes, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Yahshua the Messiah, excuse me, Yahshua himself being the chief cornerstone. For we are being gathered together unto heavenly Jerusalem, not geographical Jerusalem in Palestine, which is the mother of us all. It's Galatians 4 and 26. Uh, you guys, want, well, let's finish these two par paragraphs then. Wherefore, after the revelation of Yahshua from heaven and the renovation of the earth by fire, we shall appear with him in glory. For ye are not coming to the mount that might not be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. But ye are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living El, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and to the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to Yahweh, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, as Hebrews 12 and 8, excuse me, 12 and 18 and 23 through 24. We look not for the restoration of the physical holy lands to their original height, of ancient biblical stature and glory by any modern day movement, nor do we look for the so-called physical Jew to return to the geographical holy lands, as some believe since the establishment of the Zion Zionist movement, with the express desire of recreating the ancient national Ju Judaic state and to rebuild the temple there with the intent of offering up physical animal sacrifices while they yet await the first appearance of the Messiah especially now in this present dispensation of grace. As we have already stated, the true Jew is not one outwardly in the flesh, but one inwardly in the spirit. Therefore, a so-called physical Jew, regardless of his circumcision, for he has rejected Yahshua the Messiah, that's Matthew 8 and 17, is in reality a Gentile. And again, repeating ourselves, till the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled during which the Holy Lands and Jerusalem will be trodden down under their feet. In conclusion, Yahweh now dwells and resides in the temple not made with hands, but in the temple of your body, which temple is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
whose name is Yahshua the Messiah, which now offers up spiritual sacrifices and maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So that is essentially the end of that section on 2300 days and the, and the uh, cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, we got about 10 minutes. As I said, when we begin, uh, we take however, however long you guys want to take. And we'll just go through this. And then next class, we can definitely get into, uh, you know, uh, the comments. We can go back. We're going to go back and read again, whatever, you know, whatever the teachers want to do. We'll do that. And we'll go through it. I do want to say that I appreciate everybody's input today and everybody helping out. I know it might have started a little disjointed, but Yahweh got us got us going. So, uh, Well, you got uh, what you're dealing with when you're breaking down the 2300s. You know, you're getting all basic. Nothing right, right, more, right. Unless you're getting what we call meats. We eating steaks and all that. You know, we right. eating good now. And to really, really understand is you really, truly got to understand that tabernacle, tabernacle pattern, how it's operating. If you understand that type, the principles of the officiation of that tabernacle, and what was actually going on in that tabernacle pattern, then you go to the scriptures and you see what the scriptures was pointing to. Everything in the scriptures was pointing to Yahshua, who was the true, um, who was the true pattern of the universe, so he, he is the true pattern, Yahshua the Messiah, and everything in the scriptures is pointing to him, but he came that you can see everything as it was broken down in the law and the prophecy to the fulfillment of Yahshua fulfilling everything in the scriptures according to how the scriptures wrote about him, because it's all about Yahshua, but in order for us to truly get an understanding of him, we must truly understand the basic structure and function of that tabernacle pattern. Because mm. as you see, it reverted back to that tabernacle pattern because the 23, actual 2300 days is really about the death, burial, or re the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So I would admonish everybody to really get to know that pattern. And mm. um, if you want to read some more on that, what they was talking about with Adam and Yahshua, you could read that generator and degenerator, regenerator in the text. And Dr. Kenley's mm. text mm. transcripts, you know, to get an understanding where Yahshua is picking Adam up. You know, and Adam is known as the degenerator, and Yahshua is the regenerator. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's, uh, it's everything that we've been talking about coming together. Right, right. You know, and everybody was saying the same thing. It might sound like I'm, I'm clearly listening, it might sound like we was all on some different sheet, but if you read mm -mm. it back, we all were mm -hmm. saying the same thing and giving good inputs because right. it's a lot. It, it, it is a lot, but if you stay with the pattern and you see how they correlate this right. 2300 days with the pattern and with the things to, that happen in the scriptures, if you keep those basic principles, right. it, it's really more, it, you begin to understand, but you got to stay on the pattern. Right, right. Thank you, Dr. Crook. And uh, you're right, everybody was saying the same thing. I think... Uh, like I'm going to keep saying it because that struck me when Dr. Kinley said it, we we're going to sweat it out. So these are the things, these things are important. We got to get into it. I don't, I'll speak for myself. I know I've skirted around and danced around this for a long time because I didn't want to deal with the calculations. But if we take the time and, and keep in mind also that Yahweh is the one who reveals. And so if we put the effort in, he'll give us a revelation. So that's why we're going through these things. I, again, I truly appreciate everyone's input, um, and we'll continue with it next week and the week after or whenever, you know, however long it takes until you guys say you, you, you're ready to move on. But this will require each of us to uh, um, study on our own, you know, and ask Yahweh to give you revelation. Don't don't make it. I, I don't know. I can just speak for myself. I hear other people talk about it. I know people tend to do that, make this a real big, complicated thing. Remember, it's showing, like uh, Dr. Crook just said, death, burial, resurrection of Yahshua is showing the, the 490, all of that stuff is showing Yahshua fulfilling the scriptures. And so it's so further I, witness and proof. Yes. Um, one thing I'd like to suggest that maybe we could do, if it allows, if it fits in your programming for the next session is, is to uh, take the first few minutes of the session and allow members of the class or particularly 
partakers of this um, lessons that we're going through to take maybe 30 seconds apiece and just talk about something that they've learned just from tonight's session that they didn't know before. Okay, that sounds like a good idea to me. Sounds good to me. All right, so we'll do it. Go ahead. I'm in comment, Doc. Mm -hmm. Got okay. about three minutes. All right, I'm not trying. Okay, I'll just say this. What I'm looking at, I'm looking at running through the 490 year cycles and from Adam all the way down to Yahshua the Messiah to the revelation from heaven. This is a divine timetable that we're talking about. And we're talking about the dedication of a spiritual temple and the temple of our bodies. He's running through the whole thing. And he's saying that these prophecies must come to pass on time. You can run that all the way through the Bible, what he's dealing with. And, and all those things that we discuss will fit in your ages and dispensation chart in that those three ages. Mm -hmm. So that's mathematically figuring out. Now he say you, he's fulfilling. There's a divine timetable that we're looking at and that we're running. So this is mathematically. And when you see that, that's proven the existence of Yahweh and its purpose from beginning to the end. Right, okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Guy. Rochelle? Rochelle, did you have something? No. Oh, okay, I saw you no. on mute. <laughs> okay. All right. No. To, to uh, Dr. Dye's point, uh, Dr. Rhonda Brazil uh, sent me over the weekend the Asian dispensation chart from the uh, God, the archetype original pattern, which has this all detailed in it. And so uh, I sent that in the email tonight. So you see, it covers the 490, the, uh, the uh, see, 490 years, covers all of that. And um, I sent it in the email. So uh, at some point, Dr. Brazil is going to go through this. <laughs> I asked her to do it maybe tonight. But, huh? You say what? <laughs> you ain't right. Oh, no. Well, no, I asked her to do it tonight. I, I knew we weren't going to get through this tonight. I don't even know what I was thinking. But about. that's wonderful. I think she could I think she could do it very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it'll be a whole class ever because, as you know, we know Yahweh is the true teacher anyway. So, anyway, this is some more homework. If you guys wanted to send that email, this is in God, the Archetype Original Pattern of the Universe. So, uh, I don't think it's in Elohim, the Archetype. I know it's not in this section. I look for it in the section we just read. So, this, this is in the same section and God, you know, they, they kind of reformatted it. So some things are a little different. So this is in the section on the 200, uh, 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary. So anyway, we are out of time again. I true. I'm truly thankful to Yahweh. Um, I am truly thankful to Yahweh for, uh, just working with us and, uh, for all of you guys, all your input and thank you all for being patient. I really didn't know how to do this. So anyway, we're going to keep with it. Uh, as I said, these things are important. And uh, this is what will solidify our faith. I know we all ask for more faith in Yahweh. The more you learn in Yahweh, the more faith he gives us, the more he will reveal to us. So with that, we will close with the doxology. We hold classes here on Tuesdays and Thursdays on Zoom uh, from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And on Sundays from 11.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. We're going to close with the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong all glory, majesty, dominion, and power for all times, now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Love you guys. See you Bye, next Michelle, week. Thanks. Love you. Love Hallelujah. you.